Building the Future, this week on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a backseat to the people who are doing it. Aaron Tanaka and the Center for Economic Democracy up next. Donald Trump's cabinet is said to be the wealthiest in U.S. history, with a shared net worth in the region of $13 billion. That's greater than the world's 70 smallest countries combined. The power of the haves to decide our future and even the world's couldn't be more obvious, nor could the disparities more clear. Is this a situation that can hold? A Quinnipiac poll taken in early January revealed that only 45% of American voters said that Trump would take the nation in the right direction. 49% said he would take the nation the wrong way. 45% of voters said his election made them feel less safe, while 27% just as safe or more safe. People fear even as they are despondent. In that same poll, just 27% said they thought that the Trump administration would make their financial situation better. The same percentage who said he'd hurt it. 42% of, of people polled said he'd make no difference. So people are expecting mostly bad, not good, or nothing to change, even after an election that was ostensibly all about change. So what are we missing? At least one thing we're missing is a clear picture of what change might look like, an alternative, a future that could be different for our families, our communities, our world. Our next guest is someone who thinks about these questions a lot. He's Aaron Tanaka, founder of the Center for Economic Democracy. His current project, Ujima, set to launch in 2017, intends to build a democratic community development ecosystem and local economy in the Boston area with a mission to invest in local businesses, create jobs, and distribute wealth, especially, especially among communities of color. Aaron, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Thank you, Laura. Very happy um, to be here. It's hard, isn't it? With so much on the horizon and so much coming down all around us to focus on the future. I found myself saying mm -hmm. this morning, it, it, it's hard to focus on the future with so much blood on, this, on, this, on the screen, you know, right. on the window. Right. Um, how are you doing it? How are you thinking about the times we're in? Yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a very challenging uh, time. You know, we have uh, Trump becoming the president. It's really happening. And um, I think many of us have been in shock for a couple of months now. Um, and so for me, you know, it raises the, the questions on what are we going to do different? And, um, and at the same time, how are we sort of pushing the trajectory that we've been building around building long-term alternatives to the capitalist extractive economy? And so I think, you know, for us, we're challenged to think about the defensive measures uh, really stepping out, uh, supporting the leadership of undocumented people, um, Muslims, women, LGBT communities, you know, all the people are going to be under attack and at the same time uh, not letting the fear and the defensiveness overtake our, our, our communities and our movement. Um, and I think part of the reason that, you know, there, there are many reasons that we lost, but when you look at some of the actual uh, exit polling, you see that a lot of the reasons that Trump was able to win wasn't because he mobilized a huge new group of voters. It was really, uh, you know, particularly in, say, Michigan, Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, we saw, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of voters who voted for Obama who just didn't come out for Hillary, right? right? And so the question for us is, you know, you, you could have the trajectory or goal of sort of trying to speak to this sort of white um, middle class or populist or white working class sort of populist uh, community, which is, I think, important for us to be thinking about. But I think there's a danger in moving yeah. too far in that direction and forgetting the folks who we're able to put yeah. President Obama in office in the first place. Yeah, and, and people have pointed out over and over again on this show, mm -hmm. certainly since the election, mm -hmm. that the Electoral College winner-take-all map that is all red, right. mostly, right. Um, is very misleading, yep. uh, especially when you think of all the people whose votes weren't counted. That's right. Um, and the popular vote, of course, that left Hillary Clinton um, with a clear majority. Right. Of I mean, work. and not to mention just the, you know, the 40 percent of people who didn't vote, period, exactly. right? And we've always known about this. But our question is really how do we speak to those folks, the folks who are so disaffected, who don't feel like politics is, is for them at all? And for us, we think um, a need for a bolder, more visionary strategy is what's going to really mobilize and activate, animate um, people who have been so far left out of the system. So let's talk a bit about your trajectory, because mm. I think it's reflective. Mm. Um, Tell us a bit how you went from, I mean, the bits that I know of your story include growing up on the West Coast, going to Harvard, 
becoming an, an intern with mm -hmm. a reading program in prison, right. um, getting involved in the Ban the Box campaign, yeah. helping Massachusetts become, I think, the second state to ban the box yeah. um, on employment forms, mm -hmm. whether or not you've been incarcerated. Um, then gradually moving into this economic empowerment work, first yeah. as an, uh, uh, an organizer of co-ops mm -hmm. and then a funder of co-ops. Right, right. Do I have it more or less right? Yeah, that was pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oftentimes people ask me for the trajectory and it, it is, um, uh, well, you know, I've been very lucky to kind of follow what I see as sort of a deeper and deeper root cause. And so, you know, I was, I, I grew up in California and went to a very urban public school, very underfunded, um, but was very lucky to get into Harvard and felt you know, from really the first day of the sort of extreme privilege that I had been granted and knew at the same time um, the ways in which my classmates were struggling just to survive. And so for me, uh, my first year, I started tutoring at a juvenile detention center because I was familiar with the school to prison pipeline. I saw some of it play out in front of me. Um, and now as a, you know, growing adult, I wanted to do something about it. Um, and at the same time, I felt like we weren't, you know, going to be able to tutor our way out of the prison industrial complex. And so for me, that's what led me to starting to do prison reform organizing and really started working with uh, formerly incarcerated people and family members with loved ones inside. And we were working actually on the issue of solitary confinement. So that was really the first community organizing campaign. Um, and that really brought me into understanding, um, you know, I started asking why do we have this system of solitary confinement, which is, you know, in my opinion, really one of the um, embarrassments of modern American civilization, the, the ways in which we cage people for 23 hours a day for months and years, if not decades at a time. Um, and then I started asking the question, <clears throat> well, why do we have the prison system in the way that we do in itself? And that's um, really the, the, where, the place that I was able to do this work was the Boston Workers Alliance, which is the first organization that I helped start and got to run for almost eight years. And there we started working around the issue of, uh, or working with people who were formerly incarcerated or who had criminal records, but couldn't find work. Uh, who are unemployed, chronically jobless, or underemployed, and started organizing people around that issue. And so, for me, if we really wanted to end the prison system, it began to be clear that we needed to deal with the economic yeah. system underlying. And so that's we've had um, mm -hmm. Peter Linebaugh on the show with the history of the beginnings mm -hmm. of industrial capitalism right. and the role that incarceration and the police, mm -hmm. the police actually right. played in shepherding people, really coercing people out of a more agrarian lifestyle right. into the fairly isolated yep. industrial one. Right. Um, I don't know whether to ask you about the challenges right now or the vision, but let's, and the principle of this program, mm -hmm. focus on the vision first sure. and come back to the challenge. Absolutely. Ujima, mm -hmm. what is it? Why now? And what's been the reaction so far? So the Ujima project then, uh, which is a project of the Center for Economic Democracy, but really a, a really collaborative project that includes dozens of amazing organizations. Um, the question became, how do we com combine a community organizing strategy with sort of the business and finance strategy? So maybe first I would just say at a political level, I think that at the, you know, in cities and progressive places, we do have quite a bit of power compared to, you know, some right. of the, the broader red that we see across the country. And so the question is, how do we really build the governance power of our own communities to really, you know, take the, take the power where we have it, right? And I think a key piece of that has been really aligning the private sector, the small business community, or even the, the co-ops in, in our community with the grassroots community, political organizing, the labor sector, for example. And we've seen, unfortunately, that these two sectors, even though they're very aligned in their intentions, don't really talk much to each other. So we have Fight for 15 that's doing amazing work um, holding the big multinationals accountable. Around the minimum wage. Right. But we don't necessarily do much to support the small businesses in our own community who are struggling but want to pay $15 an hour, for example, right? Well, you're getting to a really important point, and we mm -hmm. will hear about Ujima in just a yep. second. But it speaks to where we are right now also. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know about the conversations that you've been in since the election of 2016. Right. I've been in many where exactly that divide is crystal clear. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of community organizations and activist groups right. talking about fight back, sanctuary, mm -hmm. um, resistance, opposition, right. and very little conversation with, well, how do we actually meet the needs yep. that are coming up? Needs to employ one another, feed right. one another, have housing mm -hmm. we can rely on in these delicate times. Yep. Now, I'm usually the person in the room that says, wait a minute, this gives us a chance to do all these things the way we want to do them anyway, mm -hmm. respond to mm -hmm. immediate needs in the way we want to do them in the future, right. do them right. differently, right. create the institutions that we want in our, in our world going forward. Mm -hmm. But I'm usually the 
lone voice, and it's hard to make that stick. Right, right. Well, I think part of it is, you know, getting people to see the ways in which their interests are tangibly and truly aligned. And so there is sort of this, there has been a way in which the right wing has been able to co-op sort of the private sector, that if you're pro-business, then you're conservative, right? Um, but we know that the ways in which uh, right wing and really, you know, Democratic policies or Democrat party policies also play out um, is not in favor of small businesses, that they're giving massive tax, uh, tax breaks and subsidies to multinational corporations that are pushing uh, the race to the bottom of co economy that hurts small businesses, right? And so, um, you know, our question is how do we actually, beyond sort of the, uh, the political alignment, which we need to do in the longer term, but helping people see the ways in which they can support each other. Um, and we do think that if we want people to fight for something big, that we need to help people see what mm. that could look like, you know, and so. And Ujima is kind of doing just that. Yeah, and we're trying to be very big about it also. So um, what happened last summer? Yeah, so, um, you know, the Ujima project first, Ujima is the Kwanzaa, uh, one of the Kwanzaa principles, um, stands for collective work and responsibility. And so we sort of held this value of solidarity as a guiding principle for the work we're doing. And Ujima was um, started by a collaboration of grassroots community organizations like City Life, Vida Urbana, uh, Boston NAACP, uh, who are amazing, you know, have deep relationships in Boston's low-income communities of color. Um, and then we have uh, investors like Boston Impact Initiative, and we have supporters from the foundation community like the Access Strategies Fund and Solidago uh, Foundation in Massachusetts. Uh, so we have these different stakeholders, and we have small businesses like Cerro, uh, Haley House, which is amazing, um, uh, social enterprise that supports ex-prisoners, for example. And so they were we, all in a room. Right, so we all came together and we said, you know, what can we do um, leveraging our collective power, right? And thinking of power not only as the political power we hold, but also as the investment capital that we collectively wield, as well as the consumption power that we also hold. And so the first step for us has been to put together, uh, working to put together a investment fund. And we actually piloted this idea in August uh, as a small uh, demonstration of what a long-term multi-stakeholder investment vehicle lo could look like. Um, so we had uh, everyday people in, in August, we had about 175 people who put together uh, $20,000 with a couple of matching investors and um, really started raising the question of what would it look like for us to democratically decide how to invest our capital. So whether or not you put in $50 or $5,000, we actually have an equal vote mm -hmm. in deciding who we want to lend to, the kinds of priorities that are going to be for a fund, the expectations in terms of the ecological, labor, social practices of the businesses also that we want to see. And so we actually had um, a day, we called it the Solidarity Summit, and we had about uh, 200 people who came together and we had five um, black and immigrant owned companies. Some of them, for example, one is a black owned bike shop that wants to convert into a worker owned co-op. And they actually pitched to the community. Um, they shared what their vision for their business was, how they were benefiting the actual neighborhood, um, their goals for the future. And then uh, the residents and the investors had the chance to actually talk to them directly, ask questions, and then at the end we voted. Uh, and so it was an example of taking this idea of participatory budgeting, which is something that's been fairly popular or growing in popularity, uh, around the allocation of tax dollars, you know, city government money, and taking that idea that everyone should have collective and equal control over capital and bringing it into the investment mm, space. Mm. You actually made a video. Let's take a look. Awesome. About 200 people from our communities, from Roxbury and Dorchester and Mattapan and Jamaica Plain, from Boston's communities of color, came together in this wild experiment. Who in this room is planning to make a loan to support a business today? Can you please raise your hand? Boat and Bike School, A. B, Fidalgo Wholesale. C, Fresh Food Generation. D, Norma's Catering. E, Sydney, JD Design. Online, we are now 91% funded. <laughs> We raised $10,000 in three days. 200 people from across the communities came together to decide what to do with that money. Five businesses from our communities pitched their ideas and talked about not just why they were good business investments, but also what they were doing already to support the, the growth and the well-being of our community. My dream is to have my own restaurant so people in the community can go and enjoy food and relax and have a good time. 
we are a youth employer. We do whatever the people ask us to do. I see a vision that I'm able to expand and have seafood. Ujima is trying to create something new, a grand community dream and experiment that helps us answer the question, um, what would a people's economy look like if we designed it and created it and nurtured it um, ourselves? Like a lot of people, particularly black people from the inner city, I was not thrilled about the prospect of engaging with traditional banking and traditional lending, so I did not do it. Finding out about the efforts of community members like me to leverage pooled lending sources to take a bit of the fear and the anxiety and hesitance away from lending, period, and actually engage people of color with good ideas and get money into their pockets in a way that's palatable and that we could actually get with. Uh, I was so on board. Ujima is not only filling the gap where the conventional market's dollars wouldn't go, they're going way, way beyond it. To have a democratic economy means that the control and the direction of our dollars shifts from the 1% into the hands of the 99%. I don't live in some fortress on a hill. I live right here. If I'm not doing everything possible that I can to uplift and engage youth and formerly homeless people and incarcerated folks and marginalized people who are generally shut out of the economy, I feel like I'm not doing my job as a community organizer or an entrepreneur. When you're in the zone of, of what if you know, imagining what's possible, and then actually getting a chance to do something tangible to realize your goal. There's something about that that's um, that's life-giving. It's inspiring. So is this unique to Boston, or could this happen anywhere? I mean, we think that you know there's already many experiments in which people are pulling community capital and driving them um, to sort of build the future that they want. So we think that um, our contribution is this idea that no matter how much money you put in, everyone should have an equal vote. And that's, um, that's really a theoretical and political commitment that certainly any other community can do. Um, and part of our goal is to actually build this sort of demonstration project so that we can share and replicate this model. And so I, mean, I should say a little bit more about the project itself because not only are we really working to set uh, or, or organize our investment capital, but we're asking the question, well, if we're going to invest in a bunch of businesses, how else can we support them? Because we know we want to invest in mom and pop shops, but they're competing against Walmart, for example. So how do we make sure that our own investments are going to be viable? And so the ways in which we're thinking about this, uh, a key way is organizing our consumer capital. And we're actually exploring the creation of a alternative local currency, mm. something that I'm sure that you've talked about you know, quite a bit in the past. So a real integrated approach, right. a kind of participatory urban development right. Um, right. project. There's so much more that I, I'd love you to talk about. We can get more information to our viewers and Absolutely. listeners um, yeah. through our website. Um, final point, just briefly, mm -hmm. how do you assess the energy for this in these times? Has the energy for Ujima flagged as mm -hmm. people are so worried about the Trump administration? And, what might be coming down economically? You know, I think it's, it's hard to say because I do think there's a real need for shifting some of our general capacities and movement to be responsive. Um, but I am feeling at this moment that people are uh, more hungry than ever for meaningful and true alternatives. And so, you know, as we see the ways in which the Democratic Party is sort of has become stale and, and less relevant for people, there is this real hunger for not only learning about alternatives, but actually participating, getting their hands dirty. We, li we love the saying that the heart learns what the hands do. Uh, and in our case, we're really creating a space for people to use uh, their hands of democracy. Aaron Tanaka and the Center for Economic Democracy. Thanks so much for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you. We'll put more information at our website. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders of The Laura Flanders Show for the Progressive Voices Channel on TuneIn.
Barack Obama spent the Dr. King holiday doing service. Donald Trump, let's just say, did not. While the one fed the homeless, the other attacked civil rights leader Congressman John Lewis. The contrast between the two men could keep us entertained or aghast for weeks. But the longer we stay focused on the individuals, the later we'll focus on what's really going on, namely a long time incoming crisis in our institutions of government. Who governs is important, but what we really need to be talking about is government itself. Let's remember that least discussed statistic. 49% of eligible voters, some 117 million Americans, didn't even cast a vote in a country where registering is pretty darn difficult. That level of non-participation reflects an alienation that should be setting off alarm bells. What is happening to our democracy? Take some distance from the every four or six year cycle that keeps our money media so obsessed and so well funded, and we're looking at a historic crisis playing out on our watch. Let's remember, the only reason people of property ever agreed to share power in the first place was because they feared what would happen if they didn't. Parties of property extended the franchise to the landless and workers as a way to keep their system ticking over, and because they were forced to do it. Government persuaded the owners of corporations and capital to agree to share some goods and services with the public to even out a fairly uneven system. And that was all well and good while those owners were into sharing and the public were well organized and united enough to keep them worried about disturbance. For years now, though, the owners of private capital and Wall Street have been hoarding, not sharing, and buying influence over our government. With Trump's election, energy company CEOs, bankers, and people who've become billionaires of things that used to be public services like education are literally taking over government. They're going into office. The compromise cobbled together between private capital and the people is broken. Private capital, cruel and crude, without a conscience, has won. Trump is draining the swamp, all right, of every last drop of public service juice. So that's the downside. The upside is we get to reimagine government. Let's face it, the system I've just described was never meant for most of us. That's why strategies to resist oppression need to be coupled with those we talk about here to expand participation in community governance. Projects like the Southern Assemblies Movement, which grew out of the failed federal response to Hurricane Katrina. Participatory budgeting, which is spreading across the country. Or community development and investment projects like the Ujima Project in Boston. You can watch my interview with Aaron Tanaka about Ujima this week on The Laura Flanders Show on KCET, Link TV, Free Speech TV, and our own YouTube channel. And write to me. That's Laura at lauraflanders.com. I do my best to write back to every email I get. If you prefer to listen and watch this program, sign up for our audio podcast. And to receive these commentaries free every week, subscribe at our station. Stay kind, stay curious. For the Progressive Voices channel on TuneIn, I'm Laura Flanders.